Hello everyone. Today in this video, we are going to learn about the imaging of temporomandibular joints. We will learn different imaging techniques and different disease categories of the temporomandibular joints. We will also learn the principle of TMJ image interpretation. So without much delay, let's proceed. Because many radiographic features are subtle, I recommend that you watch this video on a large screen, ideally a desktop screen. However, instead of keeping at the default YouTube size, you may want to fill up the whole screen. A desktop screen is best to see the details on a radiograph. A laptop screen is also good. If you want, you may also watch it on a tablet. If you watch these videos on a smartphone, you may not get the best benefit. These videos are created at a 4K resolution. If possible, please watch it at the highest resolution. So what are the different techniques for imaging the temporomandibular joints? First, we have the plane films. There are several types of plane films and these are mostly obsolete. We are not going to spend time on describing or learning from the plane films. The next technique that we have is the panoramic radiography. This is an excellent imaging technique to evaluate both the joints at the same time. The limitation of panoramic radiography is that it only shows the bony structures. We also have MDCT, which shows cross-sectional views of the temporomandibular joints. The limitation of a CT is that it mostly shows the bony structures. Because of the cost and the size of the machine, an MDCT unit is not suitable for most dental offices. An MRI is also not suitable for most dental offices. Similar to an MDCT, it also shows cross-sectional imaging and excellent for soft tissue evaluation. A CBCT also shows cross-sectional imaging with only the bony tissues. Because of the size and the cost of the CBCT units, this is an ideal unit for dental offices. These are the good and the bad of the panoramic radiography. It's a good initial examination that shows both the joints at the same time. The problem is that that information is insufficient for making a diagnosis. A panoramic radiograph may show significant erosion, sclerosis, or osteophyte. The problem is that these erosions, sclerosis, or osteophyte may be covered by superimposing bony structures. We can compare the right and the left joint at the same time on the same image. The problem is that panoramic radiographs frequently suffer from positioning errors. So a discrepancy in the size of the joints may be only due to positioning errors. There are some new pen machines that have TMJ programs. The problem is that these TMJ programs also do not provide enough information. Let's start with the cone beam CTs. It is less radiation and less cost than a medical CT. It has high resolution images, provides thin sections in millimeters or fraction of millimeters, it can provide corrected sagittal and coronal slices. The limitation of a CBCT scan is that there is no soft tissue information. A CT scan has similar benefits as a CBCT scan. The resolution of a CT scan is usually less than the CBCT scan. Again, it's not ideal for soft tissue changes. The radiation dose is high, so is the cost. MRI can provide excellent information about the disc location and displacement with about 95% accuracy. The osseous details are poor, although you can get some bony information. Soft tissue changes, including fluid accumulation, is excellent on an MRI. Fluid and joint effusion are excellent. 
the limitation of an MRI image is that it's protocol dependent. This is the roadmap for our today's video. We'll start with how to read TMJ images, mostly on CBCT images. We'll talk about arthritis or inflammatory changes of the temporomandibular joints. We'll talk about internal derangement or disc positions. We'll spend some time on talking about the developmental anomalies of the temporomandibular joints. Obviously, we'll have to talk a little bit about the tumors. And finally, we'll end this lecture with trauma or fracture of the temporomandibular joints. Let's start with principle of TMJ interpretation. Today, I'm using on-demand 3D software. You may use any other CBCT software. Most of the software will have similar interface, although not identical. Before we start to evaluate the temporomandibular joints, it's essential that we rule out any dental pathology. And we can do this by going through the sections or slices. Also, we have to look at the reconstructed panoramic radiograph with particular attention to the size discrepancy of the condyles and the vertical dimension of the right versus the left condylar head. There may be hemimandibular hyperplasia or hemimandibular hypoplasia. I will also look at the sinuses to rule out any sinus diseases. The best way to study the sinuses is by following the MPR views or multiplanar reconstruction. This lecture is not about sinuses, so we are not going to discuss any finding on this set of images. We'll look at the sinuses on the coronal slices, on the axial slices, as well as on the sagittal slices. After evaluating the dentition and the sinuses, we are going to evaluate the temporomandibular joints. From the axial view at the level of the condyles, we will create custom slices through the long axis of the condylar heads. We will ensure that these slices are through the long axis of the condyles. The resultant images are called corrected sagittal or modified sagittal and corrected coronal or modified coronal images. I try to keep eight windows for each joint. Also, I try to keep all the images at the same size. With the images at the same size, I'm ready for interpretation. There are several features that I would like to evaluate on the corrected sagittal and corrected coronal slices. These cartoons show the corrected sagittal and corrected coronal views of the temporomandibular joints. Let us identify components of the temporomandibular joints as seen on these cartoons representing the CBCT scan. The right and the left temporomandibular joints. The condylar head is the part of the mandible. The bony depression is part of the temporal bone known as the glenoid fossa or mandibular fossa or articulating fossa. Anterior to the condyle, we have the articular eminence. The most inferior part of the articular eminence is called the crest or apex or the peak of the eminence. Between the condyle and the articular fossa is the joint space. In this joint space is the interarticular disc. On a CBCT scan, the disc is not visible. However, if the joint space is narrow on a CBCT scan, there is a good chance that the disc is displaced. On the corrected coronal views, the lateral surface is here for the right joint and the lateral surface is here for the left joint. 
With this knowledge of the basic anatomy of the temporomandibular joints, let us continue with the principles of interpreting TMJ images on a CBCT scan. First, at the midline of the condyle, we should identify the position of the condyle in the fossa. The distal position of the condylar head may suggest anterior disc displacement. At this time, we should also evaluate the width of the joint space if the width is uniform. We should compare the sizes of the condyles to rule out hypoplasia or hyperplasia of the condyles. We should also compare the overall shapes of the condyles including the presence of an osteophyte. We should look at the shapes of the articular surfaces if the articulating surface is round or flat. We should look at the thickness of the articulating surfaces, whether these are well corticated or sclerosed. We should also look at the continuity of the articulating surfaces to rule out any erosion or presence of subcortical pseudocyst. Evaluating these seven radiographic features is essential for temporomandibular joint CBCT image interpretation. With the understanding of the radiographic features of the temporomandibular joints, let us proceed to discuss some of the diseases of the temporomandibular joints. We have crossed the first milepost. Let's start with arthritis of the joints. Arthritis or inflammation of the temporomandibular joints is the most common chronic disease of the TMJs. The temporomandibular joints may suffer from any form of arthritis. The most common is osteoarthritis. In my clinical practice, on a typical day, I see four or five cases of osteoarthritis of the temporomandibular joints. Less common is rheumatoid arthritis. Maybe I see one or two cases every three or four months. The septic arthritis of the temporomandibular joints is rare in my practice. Other types of arthritis such as juvenile idiopathic arthritis and psoriatic arthritis are less common. Osteoarthritis is also known as degenerative joint disease or DJD. This is the most common type of arthritis of all the joints. In other joints, Osteoarthritis is considered age-related. Everyone past the age of 40 years have some features of osteoarthritis. Frequently, the weight-bearing joints will show signs of osteoarthritis. In the temporomandibular joints, osteoarthritis may not be age-related. We suspect that degenerative joint disease of the temporomandibular joints start after the interarticular disc is displaced and there is contact between the condylar head and the glenoid fossa or the articular eminence. Degenerative joint disease of the temporomandibular joints are not diagnosed by clinical or histopathological examinations, although clinical findings are often helpful in predicting DJD. The diagnosis of DJD is based primarily on the radiographic findings. For diagnosing TMJ DJD, the examinations of choice are CBCT or CT. MRI and panoramic radiographs may also be used mostly in advanced cases. In this paper published in 2018, we have reported that panoramic radiographs and MRI are not as reliable in diagnosing DJD of the temporomandibular joints. While using CBCT or CT, there are a few radiographic features that help us in arriving at a diagnosis. Let us discuss these features. These are the five radiographic features that we use in arriving at a diagnosis for degenerative joint disease. One is subcortical sclerosis, flattening of the condylar head or the articular eminences, surface erosion, subcortical pseudocyst, and osteophyte. A surface flattening is defined as loss of rounded contour 
of the surface of the condyle or the articular eminence. Subcortical sclerosis is an increased thickness of the cortical plate in the load-bearing areas related to the adjacent non-load-bearing areas. An osteophyte is a marginal hypertrophy with sclerotic borders and an exophytic angular formation of the osseous tissue arising from the surface of the condyle. Surface erosion is loss of the continuity of the articular cortex. And a subcortical pseudocyst is a cavity below the articular surface that is not same as normal marrow pattern. We have described the radiographic diagnostic features or diagnostic criteria of the temporomandibular joints in these two papers. This paper published in 2009 describes the RDC-TMD, Research Diagnostic Criteria of the Temporomandibular Disorders. Later in 2016, we updated the diagnostic criteria and published in Dental Clinics of North America. We'll consider a joint to be normal if it has no sclerosis, no flattening, no erosion, no pseudocyst, and no osteophyte. If a condyle does not show any of these radiographic features, we'll consider this condyle to be normal. For remodeling of the joints, we'll consider presence of sclerosis, and or flattening. So one of these two features will make a diagnosis of remodeling of the joint. For degenerative joint disease, we have to look for features of erosion or pseudocyst or an osteophyte. These three features can be together or just by one of the features will make a diagnosis of degenerative joint disease of the temporomandibular joints. Let's review a few cases. The reconstructed panoramic radiograph shows that the scan was obtained with the teeth in occlusion. We can see a residual peripical lesion with maxillary right second molar. There are additional dentoalveolar pathology in the mandibular left second molar region. On the MPR views, we have additional findings on the maxillary sinuses. With this information, let's review the temporomandibular joints. I'm making slices through the long axis of the temporomandibular joints. I'll ensure that the slices are through the midline of the condyles. Ensuring both the images are identical in size. So the condylar heads are well corticated. The surface is flat, slightly flattened condyles. We have adequate joint spaces bilaterally. Both the condyles are slightly anteriorly positioned in the foci. On the coronal views, we can see slight flattening of the superior margins of the condylar heads. These findings do not show any signs of degenerative changes. Remember that there are three cardinal features of degenerative joint disease, surface erosion, subcortical pseudocyst, and an osteophyte. These joints do not have any radiographic signs of degenerative joint disease. Flattening of the condylar head is a sign of remodeling of the joints. Let us review another scan. To save time, I'm already on the TMJ windows. As we can see on the corrected sagittal views, the condylar heads are posteriorly positioned in the foci. As I scroll through the left condylar head, this is an osteophyte, a bony projection at the anterior margin of the condyle. Here we have sclerotic border. The right condyle also has a small osteophyte at the anterior margin. On the coronal slices, I can see flattening on the 
lateral slopes of both the condylar heads. Due to the presence of the osteophytes, we can conclude that both the joints have signs of degenerative joint disease. Let's review another scan. Again, we are on the TMJ window. As we can see on the corrected sagittal sections, the anterior slopes of the condylar heads are in contact with the distal slope of the articular eminence. This is the distal slope of the articular eminence and that's the anterior slope of the condylar head. There is no joint space. Both the condyles are in contact with the articular fossa. As we can scroll through, we see a prominent osteophyte and also radiolucent defects consistent with erosion of the condylar head. We can also see erosion of the articular fossa. Similarly, on the left side, we can also see loss of cortical margin and a fragment of osteophyte on the anterior aspect. We'll talk about this later. On the coronal views, we can see a flattening of the superior margin of the condyle, areas of subcortical pseudocysts, and again here, the lateral slope of the condylar head is in contact with the articular fossa, and we have areas of subcortical pseudocysts. So in this patient, we see multiple features of degenerative joint disease. We can see presence of osteophytes, presence of erosion, of both the condyle and the articular eminence and multiple subcortical pseudocysts. So this would be an example of advanced degenerative joint disease. In this paper published in 2016 in Dental Clinics of North America, we have described the different stages of degenerative joint disease. We call them grade 1 or grade 2 degenerative joint disease. A joint is considered grade 1 if it has an osteophyte less than 2 millimeters or an erosion also less than 2 millimeters or a pseudocyst less than 2 millimeters. A joint will be considered grade 2 if it has an osteophyte greater than 2 millimeters or an erosion greater than 2 millimeters or a pseudocyst also greater than 2 millimeters. A joint will also be considered as grade 2 if it has one or more of the grade 1 features. This means that if there is an osteophyte less than 2 millimeters and also an erosion or an pseudocyst less than 2 millimeters, it will still fulfill the criteria of grade 2 degenerative joint disease. For our classification, we used the most advanced findings in all views to arrive at the diagnosis of degenerative joint disease. Here is an example of the degenerative changes. We published this image in the journal Dental Clinics of North America. Image A1 and A2 are from the same patient. This is corrected sagittal, this is corrected coronal. B1 and B2 from the same patient and so along. On A1 and A2, we see the margin of the condyle smooth, round, well corticated, without any loss of continuity. So we'll call this joint as normal. On B1 and B2, we see flattening of the anterior slope or flattening of the lateral slope. There is no discontinuity, there is no osteophyte, no erosion, no subcortical pseudocyst. So we'll call this joint as remodeling. On this patient, we have localized subcortical sclerosis here and some flattening. This is also an example of remodeling. Remember that for remodeling, we need one or both the features of flattening and subcortical sclerosis. In this case, we have an osteophyte at the anterior margin of the condyle. This osteophyte is less than 2 mm, so we'll call this as grade 1 degenerative joint disease. There are no evidence of subcortical pseudocyst or erosion. In this case, we have flattening of the anterior surface of the condyle with sclerosis, but we have localized erosion on the lateral slope 
this erosion is less than 2 millimeters. So this will fulfill the criteria of grade 1 degenerative joint disease. On this patient, we have no osteophyte, but we have a subcortical pseudocyst less than 2 mm in size. So this also fulfills the criteria of grade 1 degenerative joint disease. This joint has no erosion or subcortical pseudocyst but has an osteophyte greater than 2 mm so this is a grade 2 degenerative joint disease. This joint has an osteophyte greater than 2 mm also has erosion. We have subcortical pseudocyst and surface erosion so it has all the three features. With this combination, this is a grade 2 degenerative joint disease. This patient also shows presence of an osteophyte, subcortical pseudocyst, erosion, wide area of erosion, and erosion of the articular fossa. So this also fulfills a diagnosis of grade 2 degenerative joint disease. Normal joints, remodeling, Remodeling, this panel has grade 1 degenerative joint disease and this panel has evidence of grade 2 degenerative joint disease. Now that we have learned about osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, let us spend a few minutes on rheumatoid arthritis. The etiology of rheumatoid arthritis is not known. The male to female ratio is 3 to 1. Typically, the onset of rheumatoid arthritis is about 35 to 50 years of age. This disease is polyarticular, involving a lot of joints, and usually bilaterally with similar appearance on both the joints. Although it is a polyarticular disease, the TMJ involvement is not common. The radiographic features of rheumatoid arthritis include irregular shape of the joint, the condylar heads may become flat. There may be presence of pseudocysts and osteophytes. So a lot of features are similar to degenerative joint disease. Let us review a scan of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis of the temporomandibular joints. As you can see on the axial slices, the dimension of the left condyle is much smaller compared to the right. On the sagittal sections, the condyle is deformed with the presence of subcortical pseudocysts. On the coronal slices, you can see the superior margin of the condyle is flat. There is a bony projection interdigitating into the condyle. With this projection, the translation of the condyle would be limited. On the left side also, there is depression and bony destruction of the condylar head. This is the panoramic radiograph of the same patient. From the dentition, you can appreciate that the patient is young. You can also appreciate the significant size discrepancy from the left and the right condylar head. Also, you may want to pay attention to the hyperplasia of the coronoid process. This is another patient who had rheumatoid arthritis. A bite block was not used on this patient because she was unable to open her mouth at all. This is her cervical vertebrae radiographs showing significant amount of osteophytes. To evaluate the joints better, one option is to take a radiograph of hands and wrists. There are multiple joints in the hands and wrists. For hand wrist examination, the patient was asked to place her hand completely flat on the radiographic plate. This is how much she could open. This is her complete opening of the hands and you can see large inflammatory changes of the joints. All the joints are inflamed consistent with rheumatoid arthritis. Let's move to the next condition loose joint bodies. There are four broad categories. 
First is a broken osteophyte from the condyle known as joint mice. The second is synovial chondromatosis. In chondrocalcinosis, there are deposits of crystals. The tumoral calcinosis is rare and associated with renal disease. The synovial chondromatosis is a metaplasia of cartilage which may ossify into nodules, getting a name of osteochondromatosis. These may become loose from the synovium and continue to grow in size. The radiographic features of osteochondromatosis include wide joint space. In this wide joint space are multiple radiopaque entities. The friction of the condyle against these bony nodules may create erosion of the glenoid fossa. The condyles may develop signs of degenerative joint disease. Let's review a case of osteochondromatosis. This scan was recorded with the mouth partially open. So the condylar head is at the level of the apex of the articular eminence. On the left side, we can see multiple radiopaque entities on the anterior and posterior aspect of the condylar head. One, two, three, maybe more. The superior margin of the condyle is flat. There is an anterior osteophyte. The articular eminence is also flattened. On the coronal sections, we can see erosion of the lateral slope of the condylar head. Compared to the left condylar head, the superior margin of the right condylar head is well corticated and smooth. I have magnified the axial slice. On this view, you can see multiple radiopacities on the anterior and posterior aspect of the left condylar head. With the understanding of the synovial osteochondromatosis, now we have completed another milestone. Let us proceed to understand internal derangements. Internal derangement is an abnormality of the internal components of the joint. This means the disc. The articular disc is displaced from its normal functional relationship with the condyle and the glenoid fossa. There are four stages of internal derangements. Stage one is disc displacement with reduction. So the disc is displaced when the mouth is closed and it reduces when the mouth is open. Stage two is disc displacement with reduction and intermittent locking. Stage three is disc displacement without reduction. This means that disc is displaced when the mouth is closed and it does not reduce when the mouth is open. Stage 4 is disc displacement without reduction, in addition, perforation of the disc. These cartoons show the position of the disc in relationship to the condyle, articular fossa, and articular eminence. This is closed mouth, and this is open mouth. A normal disc is bowtie shaped structure with a posterior band and anterior band and a narrow central zone. If we consider the condylar head as a clock face, the posterior band of the disc is located between 1130 to 1230. So this would be a normal relationship. The central zone of the disc is in contact with the condyle and the articular fossa. This relationship is the normal disc relationship with the condyle and the articular fossa. In normal open mouth condition, the central zone of the disc is in contact with the condyle and the articular eminence. In this displacement with reduction, in closed mouth view, the posterior band is located anterior to 1130. The central zone is not in contact with the condyle or the articular fossa. 
In this case, the disc reduces to normal relationship when the mouth is open, so the central zone is in contact with the condyle and the articular eminence. In case of disc displacement without reduction, the disc is anteriorly displaced. In this stage, the disc could have a normal biconcave shape or could be deformed. It could be anteriorly located in front of the condyle or in front of the articular eminence. Let's review this MRI series to see different relationship. A1 and A2 are the same patient, closed mouth and open mouth. B1, B2, same patient, closed mouth, open mouth. So let's look at the series A1 and A2. This is the condylar head. The dark border is the cortical bone of the condyle. Articular fossa, articular eminence. This is the external auditory canal. In closed mouth view, this is the position of the disc. The disc is charcoal gray bow tie shaped structure. So the posterior bend is about 12 o'clock position. The central zone is in contact with the articular eminence. This is a normal closed mouth relationship. When the patient opens the mouth, the disc is in contact with the condylar head. This is the central zone of the disc. This is the condyle and this is the articular eminence. This is the articular fossa. So this is normal in closed mouth, normal in open mouth. In this case, here is the condyle, articular fossa and eminence. This is the posterior bend of the disc. The central zone is anteriorly located, not in contact with the condylar head. So we'll call this as indeterminate. In the open mouth, the disc reduces back to normal relationship. So condyle, articular eminence, and disc is bow tie shaped. In this case, the condylar head, articular fossa, eminence, this is the posterior band of the disc, central zone, anterior band. So we'll call this as anteriorly displaced disc. The same patient when the mouth opens, the central zone is in contact with the condylar head. So this is anteriorly displaced disc with reduction of the disc. On this image, we have the condylar head. Superior margin of the condyle is flat and irregular. As we had mentioned earlier, MRI is not the best examination to evaluate the osseous structures. This is the articular fossa and eminence. And the disc is somewhere near the articular eminence. So the disc is deformed and anteriorly displaced. During open mouth, the condyle translated to the apex of the articular eminence and the disc remain anteriorly displaced. So this is anteriorly displaced disc without reduction. This image is a proton density image and this is a T2 image. A T2 image is used to evaluate fluid. This is the same patient, condylar head. The disc is deformed. And on T2 image, we have a high signal intensity representing fluid accumulation. All the images that we have seen now are sagittal slices. The following two images are coronal slices. This is the coronal view of the condylar head articular fossa and this is the charcoal gray structure, the intraarticular disc. This is the normal relationship of the condyle and the fossa and the disc. On this view, we can see that the disc is laterally displaced. These images are proton density. All the images are proton density except this one which is a T2 image. T2 image is used to evaluate fluid. We have crossed another milestone. Now we are going to learn about developmental anomalies of the temporomandibular joints. 
There are several types of developmental problems of the condyles. The first is hypoplasia or aplasia of the condylar head, smaller condyle or absence of the condyle. There could be hyperplasia or large condylar head. And another is bifid condyle. The hypoplasia or aplasia of the condyle could be acquired, developed later in life, or could be congenital. This is an example of aplasia of the condylar heads. So coronoid process, sigmoid notch, and there is no condyle. The articular fossa is shallow because there is no condylar head. On the other side also, this is the coronoid process, sigmoid notch, and we do not have any condylar head. The articular fossa is also shallow on the right side. This shows unilateral hypoplasia of the condylar head. This condyle is flattened. On this side, we can see much smaller condylar head representing hypoplasia. This is a Treacher Collins patient. In these patients, we see hypoplastic condylar head in addition, we can also find hypoplastic zygomatic bone and zygomatic arch. In this patient, the zygomatic arch did not even form. In this case, we see unilateral hyperplasia of the condylar head. On the reconstructed CT scan, this is the right condyle sitting in the glenoid fossa. On the left side, this is the glenoid fossa, external auditory canal, and the condyle, which is hyperplastic, is permanently anteriorly dislocated. This cropped panoramic radiograph also shows hyperplasia of the left condylar head. Compare the size of this condyle to the size of the right condylar head. Right condyle is normal and left condylar head is hyperplastic. Other developmental anomalies include bifid or trifid condyles. This is a mild form of bifid condylar head, more prominent depression, and sometimes a condyle may appear as two separate condyles. Other conditions involving the temporomandibular joints is ankylosis. This ranges from fibrous adhesion to small bony addition, to a large bony bridge, and finally, the architecture of the joint is lost due to bony bridge from the ramus to the temporal bone. We may also use a simpler classification, an intraarticular ankylosis or extraarticular ankylosis. Let's review one scan showing the bony ankylosis. We are on the temporomandibular joint window. Superior margin of the left condylar head is flat. There is a prominent osteophyte. The articular fossa is shallow. And there is a subcortical pseudocyst. On the right joint, there is a prominent osteophyte, significant area of erosion, and areas of bony ankylosis where you do not see any difference between the articular fossa and the condylar head. Looking at the coronal slices, there is complete bony fusion between the articular fossa and the superior margin of the condyle. These are the areas of erosion and subcortical pseudocysts. We have crossed another landmark in learning about temporomandibular joints. Now we'll learn about the tumors of the temporomandibular joints. Tumors of the temporomandibular joints can be divided into benign and malignant. Benign tumors are the most common. Malignant tumors are rare. And when we have malignant tumors, most of these are metastatic. So this is rare. We are not going to talk about malignancy. The benign tumors, most common is osteochondroma. We also have osteoma. And we'll talk about this in a few cases. There can be other types of benign tumors as well. So let's start with an osteochondroma and try to differentiate with an osteoma. 
while we discuss about osteoma and osteochondroma, maybe you also we want to compare with hyperplasia of the condylar head. So let's proceed with a CBCT scan of osteochondroma. Again, we are on the TMJ screen. For your practice, always start with the dental view, a reconstructed panoramic view. Look through the slices to rule out any dental diseases. Look at the maxillary sinuses and then look at the temporomandibular joints. Today, to save time, I'm on the temporomandibular joint screen. Make sure that the image magnifications are the same. It's one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter. Same ruler size. So the superior margin of the left condylar head is flat with a bony projection at the anterior margin. Compared to that, the right condylar head is deformed. So the condyle is actually here. This bony growth on the superior aspect is an osteochondroma. On the axial slice, you can appreciate the outline of the condyle better. The primary condyle should have been here, but there is a bony growth. So this is an osteochondroma. How do we differentiate an osteochondroma from an osteoma? In osteochondroma, the trabecular bone is continuous with the tumor. So trabecular bone or cancellous bone of the condyle is continuous with the bony growth. There is no corticated border. Let's look at a case of osteoma to see if we can identify the margin of the condyle and the osseous growth. Finally, we'll look at a condylar hyperplasia and try to differentiate. In osteoma, we'll also see the bony growth is limited to one area. In case of hyperplasia, the bony growth will be uniform all around, maintaining the overall shape of the condylar head. This is a case of osteoma. As we can see on the axial slices, the bony growth is separated by a corticated margin. So this is the area of osteoma. There is no continuity of the trabecular bone from the condyle to the osteoma. Let me make slices and talk about it a little more. I have kept all the images the same size, same magnification. Here is the osteoma and you can appreciate a corticated border between the condylar margin and the bony growth. So this would be an osteoma. As we have seen previously with osteochondroma, the growth is only limited to one area. We'll look at a case of hyperplasia where the growth would be uniform all around the condylar head, maintaining the overall shape of the condyle. So this is a case of osteoma. In osteochondroma, the trabecular pattern would be continuous with the bony mass. This is a case of hyperplasia of the left condylar head. Right condylar head is normal. Left condylar head is significantly larger. There is posterior open bite. Let's go to that TM joint window. You can appreciate the size of the left condylar head compared to the right. This is uniformly wide from in all direction. Let me make slices. normal right condylar head and significantly large left condyle. The magnification is two centimeter and magnification is two centimeter. So you can appreciate the size difference of both the condylar heads. We have crossed another mile stop. Now we are in the final area of the temporomandibular joint learning about the trauma or fracture of the joints. A large number of the mandibular fractures involve condylar fractures. The best imaging methods for identifying trauma to the condylar heads is panoramic radiography. It shows both the condyles at the same time. You can also take CT or CBCT. An older technique was very helpful, open mouth towns, and I'll show you a few images. The classification of the condylar fracture may be based on location intracapsular, extracapsular, or subcondylar region. Based on the displacement of the fracture fragment, we can classify as 
non displaced deviated displaced may be medial or lateral or the condylar fragment is dislocated based on the orientation of the fracture we can also classify as horizontal fracture vertical fracture or compression type here are a few examples of condylar fracture on this cropped panoramic radiograph this is the fractured condylar head the fractured fragment has flipped and is displaced medially so this is an open mouth towns radiograph showing you the fractured condylar head this is the neck of the condyle the condylar head is here another open mouth towns shows a condyle is completely deviated towards the medial aspect this is the neck of the condyle articular fossa and the condylar head is here on the cbct scan we can see vertical fracture of both the condylar heads the fragments are displaced inferiorly on this image we see the right condylar head is intact the left condylar head is fractured and tipped medially on a panoramic radiograph you can identify the condylar fracture by looking at increased density most of the fractures will have a radiolucent line but in case of condylar fracture frequently condyle is deviated medially and will superimpose one good clue is to measure from the tip of the condyle to the angle of the mandible right side versus left side and the area of the fracture shows a decreased vertical dimension of the ramus another patient with fracture of the condyle this condyle is fractured and deviated anteriorly the condyle is not seated in the glenoid fossa this condyle also has a hairline fracture but without any displacement this ends our unit on temporomandibular joint imaging someday when i am reading tm joint images i see a turkey a turkey that is running after a grain someday i see a duck this is the entertainment of a radiologist thank you very much for staying with me we'll see you with another video